Invite those who are able to please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God has invited us to live as family. Yet our love for God and for each other is not what it should be. Our priorities and choices are often flawed. But the power of God's love enables us to live a new life. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for His forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart in what I have done and left undone. I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them and ask for your mercy. God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, God forgives our sins and empowers us to be his people. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We'll join... Or we'll pray now. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who is not dead but alive and rules all things with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. 
we are continuing in the reading of the Passion History. We're getting closer and closer as this is uh, Holy Week. Uh, so we're getting close to the end where Jesus uh, goes and suffers and dies in our place on the cross. And so the focus of our readings uh, today is our King is led to Calvary. So this is Jesus uh, walking to the cross. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. He was passing by on his own way in from the country. They seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed Jesus, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? The word of the Lord. Join together this morning to read responsibly the psalm for today, Psalm 24. Let the Lord enter. He is the King of glory. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Let the Lord enter. He is the King of glory. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Passion reading continues. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called Golgotha, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. It was the third hour when they crucified him. Along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left, and Jesus in the middle. Thus the scripture was fulfilled which says, He was counted with the lawless ones. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The word of the Lord. We'll join to sing the next hymn, hymn 130, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Thank you. 
Continue then with the Passion reading. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened above his head on the cross. The written charge against him read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them up into four shares, one for each of them. They cast lots to see what each would get. The undergarment remained. It was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it. They said to one another, Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among themselves and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll join us sing the next hymn, hymn 363. The King of Glory Comes. morning. So this morning is Palm Sunday, and we, we reflect on the fact that Jesus knew full what would lie before him in the week ahead. One of the hymns that we commonly sing is, 
as we speak of Jesus riding on that donkey, ride on, ride on, in majesty, right? in lowly pomp, ride on to die. The crowds didn't understand that, recognize that day. The disciples didn't understand that or recognize that day. Jesus knew full well what lay before him. This morning, if you notice, our lesson from Acts is not a Palm Sunday account, and I'm not going to be speaking a great deal of Palm Sunday. Um, spoiler alert, right? we know Jesus wins. Right? He went to the cross. He suffered the agonies of hell as a part of that, that cruel crucifixion. But he rose victorious. And our lesson today takes us to the other side of that victory. As we sit here today, we celebrate Palm Sunday, but we're the other side of that victory. And we live in, in resurrection faith. We live as beneficiaries of Jesus carrying out what lay before him in Holy Week and his victory at Easter. And so this morning we reflect upon, as the disciples did, just months beyond this, if you will, reflecting upon what it is that Jesus had accomplished and what this Holy Week meant to them, to us, to his church throughout the course of history. And the impact that this Holy Week has upon us in our lives today. Our lesson comes from Acts chapter 5, verses 29 to 32. I will give you a bit more of the context in the sermon of chapters 4 and 5 and the history that leads up to these words. But verses 29 to 30 themselves read through 32. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. My friends in Jesus, a number of years ago, my family was blessed to be able to take a vacation to Hawaii. One of the mornings we were going out to a beach on the north side of the big island, just a, a few hours after, after I'd gotten stitches in my hand. It's another story for another day. So as we head out there, my wife says, before we go out onto the beach, I need you to read these couple of lines from the tour guide book. And she put it in my hand and read and it says, as you head on onto the beach, you may notice to your left a massive cliff jutting out into the ocean. You may even notice some numbskull 20-something year olds jumping off that cliff. Don't even think about it. So we headed out onto the beach, look to my left, and there's this beautiful cliff jutting out into the ocean, the waves crashing against the base of it. And that cliff was calling to me. And my wife, who knows me well, looked me in the eye and said, didn't you just hear what you read? And I said, yeah, that, that book said that numbskull 20-something-year-old shouldn't jump off that cliff. I'm a well-grounded 40-something-year-old. I've got to jump off that cliff. Well, why do we do what we do as Christians? Why do we obey God? Because we've got to do it? Because we have to, because we must. Well, yeah. But not in terms of the law, like you got to do it or else, death and hell await you, but rather in terms of love. The love of a, of a God and a Savior who so upfront loved us first. Heaven awaits us, guaranteed. The Bible says the love of Christ compels us, right? The love of God draws us to obey. We must obey God. Take the early Christians. On the day of our lesson, the Christian church was still in its infancy stages. It had been just, just months since Jesus had risen victorious from the dead. Just weeks after Jesus had ascended back into heaven, and ten days later, kept His promise to send the Holy Spirit to, in remarkable fashion, kick off the public gospel ministries of the apostles. The early Christians were very active in sharing their faith in their, their risen Savior. Jerusalem was a bit apprehensive and yet still all abuzz about this Jesus of Nazareth. 
The apostles were preaching and teaching and healing in the temple courts, and the Holy Spirit was using all of this gospel activity to bring people to faith in Jesus and add to the number of believers. But as you can imagine, the Jewish religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, were not thrilled at the gospel's early success. And they thought that with Jesus' death, with his crucifixion, they had also put to death the name and the teaching of Jesus. But Jesus' crucifixion and, of course, his resurrection had only fueled the fire. Jesus' name, his teaching, and, of course, we know Jesus himself were alive and well. So the Jewish leaders figured that they had to take some serious and swift action. They had two of the apostles arrested, Peter and John. They interrogated them. They threatened them, told them not to dare mention or teach in the name of Jesus again. But as the apostles said, we can't help but speak about what we've seen and heard. And as they did, that only infuriated the Jewish religious leaders further. So once again, they had the apostles arrested. But this time, not just Peter and John, all of the apostles. They threw them in prison overnight to figure out what to do with them. But in the middle of the night, unbeknownst to them, and even unbeknownst to the guards who were guarding them, the Lord sent an angel to escort those apostles out of prison. But before he let them go, he gave them these marching orders. Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. So when the Sanhedrin gathered the next morning now to decide what to do with the apostles, again, to their surprise, the apostles were not in prison. In fact, somebody said, there they are again out in the temple courts preaching and teaching about Jesus. The Sanhedrin was not amused, had them arrested, brought before them again. And Caiaphas, the high priest, said to them, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. The Sanhedrin's orders were clear. They were firm. And they came with, Promises with threats of serious consequences were those orders not adhered to. But the apostles have been given other orders from a higher authority. And not just through the angel the night before, but Jesus, God the eternal Son himself, had said to them just weeks prior, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you the victorious and now glorified Savior of the world, had said to them, Preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Just weeks before, just before returning to heaven, Jesus, who is now the authority over all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth, had said personally to these men, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So there stood the apostles, eyewitnesses of history's most consequential events, sent out by God, the eternal Son himself, to testify of these things to the world. Now in that moment, standing before some of the land's highest authorities, threatening them even with death, were their orders not adhered to. Well, the decision was a no-brainer for the apostles. We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging Him on a cross. God exalted Him to His own right hand as Prince and Savior, that He might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. The apostles had a higher authority to answer to, the Lord of heaven and earth. They had a message that was worth dying for to communicate, just as Jesus had died to put it into effect, and that was the forgiveness of sins and a relationship of peace with God for all eternity. How tragic would it have been had those men caved to the pressure, remained silent, and not shared with the world what it is that Jesus had accomplished for them, for us. It would have been almost criminal 
had these men chosen to, to take the easy way out right? and not at all costs been willing to do what was necessary to make sure that that message, which alone saves the sinner, the hell that otherwise awaits him, awaits us. We must obey God rather than human beings. We have to get this message out at all costs. So for the last 20 some years, Las Vegas has been home to me. And I'm sure that some of you are familiar with the Las Vegas based magic duo, Penn and Teller. I believe they've even got a show on these days, uh, Fool Us, I think is their name. Uh, Penn Gillette is the taller of the two guys. He used to be, he used to wear a ponytail. Uh, I think he's got his hair cut short these days. He's the guy who does all the talking in their act. Both of those men are avowed, outspoken atheists. A number of years ago, Penn Gillette posted an interesting video blog. He was waxing eloquently into his computer one night talking about how ridiculous the message of the gospel is, how silly Christians are to believe this stuff. But in the midst of it, he said something interesting. He said the only Christians that he have, has any respect for are the Christians who try to witness to him. And he explained why. He said, if you truly believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, that the only way to be rescued from your sin is through faith in this Jesus who lived and died for all people, that if you refuse to believe that or don't simply don't know that, you will spend an eternity in the agonies of hell separated from God forever. If you truly believe that and you choose not to tell me, he says, how cold, how heartless can you be? In fact, he called such a thing criminal. The kind of Christians who truly believe the Bible for what it says about Jesus and what he's done for us, his victory, our salvation through faith in him, and are willing to tell others about that. Have the respect of even an avowed atheist, the likes of Penn Jillette. Are you one of those kind of Christians? Not because you want to earn the respect of Pendulette, but because you, like your Lord and Savior, want all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of that saving truth, the truth of the gospel. That Jesus lived the only perfect life on record, and he did so. Not, not to show us how we have to do it, but to do it, to be it for us, to become our righteousness, to earn our holiness before God. That Jesus then took that holy, sinless life and allowed himself to be cruelly crucified on the cross as payment for the penalty of sin. To take away sin, your sin, my sin, their sin, whoever they may be. And that three days later, inexplicably, unbelievably, miraculously, and yet truly, undeniably, Jesus physically came back to life having defeated death. And that because he lives, one day, even though we too ourselves may very well die, that we too will be raised and glorified like him to be with God in peace for all eternity. That is a message that simply cannot be believed unless heard and cannot be heard unless shared by someone like you, someone who themselves knows it, loves it, treasures it, and, and is eager to share it with those around us, with all who are around us, because that's what Jesus died for. It's actually pretty amazing, as you realize in these words, that the apostles realized in that moment that that all who Jesus died for included the very men who were demanding that they remain silent. In fact, if you put these words in, in their historical context, it's pretty remarkable to realize that among the very first people to ever hear that God's plan for salvation had now been fulfilled in the person of Jesus and was being freely distributed were the very men who orchestrated the crucifixion of Christ. The very men who, humanly speaking, brought about the death of Jesus. But that is that's the nature of God's grace, isn't it? Always has been, always will be. Unconditional, undeserved. 
Forgiveness of sins is needed by all. Forgiveness of sins is available to all. Just about this time of the year, two springs ago, there were a series of church arsons in the state of Louisiana. Over the course of 10 days, three historic uh, Baptist congregations serving predominantly African-American families were burnt to the ground by a 21-year-old man who it appears had some connections to the white supremacist movement. Shortly after those fires, Good Morning America came in to interview uh, one of the pastors of one of those churches, and it seemed that Good Morning America was looking for a, a couple good sound bites about the state of, of racism in the American Deep South and a rally cry against white supremacy or something along those lines. But instead what they got was a clear testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The pastor was asked, what would you like to say to the guy who did this? And the pastor standing in front of a 100-year-old charred pulpit holding a Bible that somehow had survived the fire inside that pulpit. He said, you know what I'd like to tell that guy? I'd like to tell him I forgive him. God has forgiven me for everything that I've ever done. I've got to forgive the guy. Another one of the pastors was interviewed by a local TV station, and that pastor said, a lot of people want to make this out to be a hate thing. Well, we don't represent hate. We represent love. Indeed. So how about you? You may not have had your church burnt down or even your house burnt down by an arson, but you have been burnt before by somebody who's tried to take advantage of you, ruin your reputation, give you a bad name, cheat you. You may not be given the chance on national television to give a clear gospel testimony to Jesus, but, but God has and He will give you opportunities to testify of Him to a friend, a, a relative, a neighbor, a co-worker. You may not be interviewed by a local TV station being asked what you'd like to say to the guy who so personally hurt you, but, but you might be asked by the guy who hurt you. Human beings would say, give him hell. Make them pay. You don't get off the hook that easy. But the heart of faith says, I must obey God rather than human beings. And how do you do that? When the pain is, is that raw, when the sin is that offensive, when the damage that that person has caused may be difficult, maybe even impossible to repair, well, the apostles gave us the answer, didn't they? The Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of you, who has made of your body His holy temple. God, the Holy Spirit, who in the waters of baptism has, has called you to repentance and has forgiven you, washed you clean of all of your sins, who has worked inside of your heart that gift of faith, who has sown within your being that fruits of faith and, and woven within your heart His love and who resides there so that you also then have the power to share those very things with those that God places around you in your life. Jesus rode on in lowly pomp to die on Palm Sunday. On that Good Friday, cruelly crucified. At Easter Sunday, God raised Jesus from the dead. And to this day, He is Prince and Savior, ruling not only throughout the world and throughout the universe, but in your own heart and in your life as Prince and Savior. God wants all people to know about this, and He wants some of them to find out about it through you. So, whose orders will you obey? And I'm not suggesting that we openly defy whatever rules may exist today at our place of employment about proselytizing on the job. Jesus himself says we need to be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. We need to be smart about how we go about doing this. What I am saying is that we do need to be much more bold as 21st century Christians in obeying the Lord. And in defying whatever unwritten and yet very real cultural rules exist in our society 
about religious indifference or tolerance, which is willing to tolerate anything but the truths of God's Word, and or this attitude that permeates our society that, that an individual's spiritual thoughts or convictions are you know, it's their own personal business not to be tampered with, that in the end it's all the same, that anybody who thinks that their God or their religion is superior is, is only an idiot. These are lies of the devil. And might there be a little uh, apprehension or fear as you, you think about this idea of stepping out a little bit more intentionally about living out my faith and, and even sharing my faith? Well, do you think there was a little apprehension as my toes were over the edge of that cliff staring at the waters below? Yeah. But there is a certain thrill, certain rush, certain exhilaration in obeying the Lord in this way. And you add to that all the Lord's promises that He attaches to, to serving as His witnesses in the world, and, it, and it, it, it takes some of the edge off of that fear. I'll share just one example. The Bible says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. God has raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus is Prince and Savior. He is the only true ultimate authority in heaven and on earth. And it is my prayer that Jesus will continue to give you the courage, the desire, the, the capacity of love to join the apostles in saying, we must obey God rather than human beings. I can do this. I've got to do this. Amen. My dear friends, May that peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds right here in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now join in singing the Apostles' Creed as it's been set to music on page 13.
for the prayer of the church. Uh, we get to receive uh, another sister in Christ to be part of our congregation. So I'll go ahead and read the um, this, and we'll make our promises and to encourage each other. So first, dear members of Divine Peace, Evangelical Lutheran Church, Melissa, Having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desires to become a member of this congregation. Sister in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before His Father in heaven those who faithfully confess Him on earth. You have come before this congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we the members of Divine Peace, Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and invite you to share in our worship and mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We'll join to pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith and mercy, who joined our sister in Christ your church when she was born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy, you taught her your saving truth. Grant that she may offer herself as a living sacrifice to you as her spiritual act of worship. Transform her by the renewing of her mind, so that she will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and welcome. Now invite those who are able to stand for the prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, you love the world, gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Holy Spirit, be with those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Great physician of body and soul, be with those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Friend of all in need, be with those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. 
move us to help and pray for those in need, especially for Angel, who is hospitalized. She's the daughter of Rosanna, who's a friend of Jim Albrecht and Jim Schrader. Those others with health concerns, Lauren Durham, friend of Alicia Boom, recovering from surgery. Doug Patterson, continuing to recover from his stroke. Terry Deluge, treatments for pain management. We with Isaac and his family. Uh, Sylvia's daughter is a friend of this child and her family. It appears that Isaac's tumors have uh, grown worse and not responded to treatments. It looks like his time in this world is going to be measured in months. But he and his family do look forward uh, to that wonderful healing that will happen when he is brought home to heaven to live with his Savior Jesus. And his family certainly looks forward to that day when they'll all be united there with him. Be with Keith Smith, friend of the Liedermans, who is dealing with many complications from surgery. Pray that God would give him strength and healing and good guidance to the doctors and certainly for kind nurses. Those suffering from the virus, all of them, and especially Gary Reynolds, Susan Gross's cousin. Pray that God would be with Desiree to give her guidance and peace in his unending love and forgiveness, his presence that is with her. We pray that his angels would attend her and that God would give his good words to her friends and family that are there for her in this time of struggle. We continue to pray for healthy pregnancies for Hannah Walston, Becca Baker, and Maria, Elena's sister. All those battling cancer, Carol, Barbara's relative, Terry Washick, Gwen Mon, Rudy Lynn, Mark Bradley, Mauricio Pargas, Jeff Parker, Brian Crawford, and Richie Clemens. We give you a prayer of thanksgiving that we got to welcome Melissa as our new member and our sister in Christ, that she would uh, benefit us with service and that we would serve and encourage her in love. We pray for our missionaries and also for their children that may be attending school here in the U.S., separated uh, from family. We pray that they are being strengthened in their faith and educated. Praying for our nation and all of its leaders. And we give you thanks for uh, sending us Pastor Matt Vogt today to give us fine encouragement to serve you rather than men. And now hear us as we bring you our private prayers. Lord, you rule all things for our good. Lead us to obey you rather than men in all we do. And now hear us as we join together to pray as you taught us. And we'll pray slowly so that the children can join with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is not dead but alive, and rules all things with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We'll join together to sing the closing song of praise, His Mercy is More.